In the mid-19th century, Britain fought a brutal and bloody war against Russia in the Crimea. The sheer scale of suffering inspired Florence Nightingale to pioneer the ideas of modern nursing. It made her an icon of Victorian virtue. But the cult of the Lady of the Lamp has cast a shadow over another hero, one of equal stature and significance. This forgotten angel of the Crimea was a doctor who became a legend among British troops at the front line. Middle-aged, illegitimate, and from the outer reaches of the British Empire, she was one of the most unlikely celebrities of the Victorian age. Her name was Mary Seacole. After a century of obscurity, Mary Seacole is reclaiming her place in history. This is the story of how a woman from Jamaica won the hearts of the British public. In 1857, Mary Seacole was so famous that 80,000 people turned out to honor her as a Crimean hero. At the height of her fame, she published her memoir, The Wonderful Adventures of Mrs. Seacole in Many Lands. It was a page-turning romp, and the first autobiography by a free black woman in the British Empire. I was born in the island of Jamaica, some time in the present century. I may well be excused given the precise date of this important event. But I do not mind confessing that the century and myself were both young together and have grown side by side into age and consequence. Mary Seacole was a Creole the term used for anyone born in Jamaica. At the time of her birth in 1805, most Jamaicans worked as slaves for their British masters. But Mary, like her mixed-race mother, was born free. I am a Creole and have good Scotch blood coursing in my veins. My father was a soldier of an old Scotch family. And to him, I often trace my sympathy for the pomp and pride of glorious war. She was very proud of her Scottish ancestry. Mary Seacole would have been born into a Jamaica where the lighter you were in terms of your skin color, the, the higher you were on the, the, the status ladder. And so the, the Scottish part of her background would have brought her pride because it, it, it gave her an inroad into white society. Her mixed ancestry may have ranked her above the mass of Jamaicans, but even free people of color were kept in their place by the whites. They'd faced a series of limitations. They couldn't vote, they couldn't participate in public office. If they went to church, they had to, they had to pray in a different pew. When they were buried, they were buried in a separate burial ground. When they went to the theater, they entered by a different door. So their connection with the white community, even though they had familial connections with the white community, was often difficult, often problematic. Among the few occupations open to free coloreds were those catering to whites. Mary's mother ran one of Kingston's top hotels, and it was patronized by the elite of the British Army. The secret of its success was that it offered far more than home comforts. Mary Seacole and her mother were doctresses, women who had a knowledge of, 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 of herbs, of, of local indigenous medicine, could cure various illnesses, at a time when some trained medical doctors didn't have a clue about tropical diseases. The hotel doubled as a hospital where sick officers were treated with traditional African remedies. Visiting British doctors were impressed. One of the more open-minded of them wrote a book, Thomas Dancer, describing the particular remedies, the particular herbs, the particular roots and seeds and concoctions that people like Mary used. And he analysed them and he said these are, in many cases, better 
than any of the Western medicines we have brought over. They are used to treat very specific conditions and they work extremely well, he said. Mary Seacole's mother was renowned for her remedies for cholera, dysentery and diarrhoea. She passed this local knowledge down to her daughter, who also picked the brains of visiting British doctors and surgeons. One soldier nicknamed her Contrary Mary. I was very young when I began to use what little knowledge I had acquired from watching my mother upon a great sufferer. Whatever disease was prevalent in Kingston, be sure my poor doll soon contracted it. Before long, it was very natural that I should seek to extend my practice. Many luckless brutes were made to simulate diseases and had forced down their reluctant throats the remedies I deemed most likely to suit their supposed complaints. And after a time I rose still higher in my ambition and despairing of finding any other human patient, I proceeded to use my medicines and my essences upon myself. The precocious child matured into a fully-fledged doctress and hotelier in a new Jamaica. The status of a free person of color was changing. In 1830, the Jamaican House of Assembly passed legislation making free people of color the legal equals of whites. Mary was able to do what her own mother could not and marry her white lover. In 1836, she accepted the hand of an Englishman from a respectable naval family from Prittlewell in Essex. Edwin Horatio Hamilton Seacole was Admiral Nelson's godson. He was a merchant and together they opened a store. He would give his wife ample opportunity to practice her skills. Poor man. He was very delicate. I suspect that in many ways it was a marriage of convenience on both sides. That Edwin Seacole, who it's clear was sickly, needed a good nurse. On the other hand, Mary, as any sensible Creole woman in that period would have thought, would have seen um, a probably fairly well-off white man as a very good stepping stone into the elite of Kingston society. I kept him alive by kind nursing as long as I could. But at last he grew so ill that he died. The death of her husband was a major setback, forcing Mary to make her own way in the world. At the age of 45, she looked beyond Jamaica and pinned her future hopes on opening a hotel in a wild frontier town in Panama. The proud Creole, who saw herself as the equal of any white, was about to set foot in a world where black people of any shade were truly second-class citizens. Mary Seacole arrived in Panama in 1851 and found a country awash with gold prospectors, free wheelers and disease. She was undaunted. I do not know what it is to be indolent. All my life long I have followed my inclination to be up and doing and I have never lacked the determination to carry out my wishes. A cholera epidemic gave Mary Seacole a dramatic opportunity to prove her skills. She was certainly very proactive for her time. She picked up all the typical remedies um, that she felt were useful. At the same time, obviously, 
she did work under the specific circumstances of mid-19th century medicine. And they were completely different from what we have now. We have to remember not a single of the synthetic drugs which we have available um, now were available then. The simplest remedies are the best. Mustard plasters and emetics and calomel. If a patient is thirsty, give him water which cinnamon has been boiled. One of the really interesting uh, remedies is cinnamon, which has been uh, boiled in water, and then you drink this resulting tea. Cinnamon is um, a very aromatic herb. I think the main effect goes back to its aromatic properties. These aromatic properties um, will have helped with sort of gastrointestinal cramps and similar things. So it's in a way um, what we today call oral rehydration therapy in a Mary Sicole way. <laughs> She practiced the full range of her healing skills, from suturing wounds to treating fever. Every patient is different. You must understand the needs of each. Some will respond to rubbing over with warm oil and comfort and spirits of wine. Above all, I never neglect to apply mustard poultices to the stomach, the spine and the neck and particularly to keep my patient warm about the region of the heart. Well, if we look at Mary Sicole and her role in 19th century medicine, she obviously is very much of a healer, coming from these classical African Caribbean traditions. All these provide the community with, on the one hand, plant and mineral-based medication, but also with advice, also with um, spiritual support, of looking after people and looking after their very personal needs. Mary C. Cole is a prime example of such a hands-on approach. Her medicine worked. She could treat the prospector's cholera. For their prejudice, however, she had no cure. In an extraordinary encounter, set down in her book, C. Cole was confronted by their overt racism. Gentlemen, I know you rejoice in joining me in a toast. Yeah. anti seco gentlemen. Yeah. anti seco yeah. We can't do enough for her after what she done for us when the yeah. time of cholera was among us, huh? Yeah, yeah. And I calculate, I calculate that you're as vexed as I am, that she's not totally whack. But, you rejoice with me that she's so many shades from being entirely black. <laughs> and I guess, I guess that if we could bleach her by any means, we would. And make her acceptable in any society as she deserves. Gentlemen, I give you Auntie Seacole. Mary was incandescent. She wanted to be regarded as Mrs. Seacole, a, a person of consequence. And this American was just bundling her with all the other busybody old ladies and all the other black people that he'd come across. She squashed that poor American down with a twist of the foot. Gentlemen, I return my best wishes for your kindness in drink and my health. But I must say, that I don't altogether appreciate your friend's kind wishes with respect to my complexion. If it had been as dark as any niggers, I'd be just as happy and as useful and as much respected by those whose respect I value. As to his offer of bleaching me, I should, even if it were practicable, decline it without any thanks. As to the society which this process may gain me admission to, all I can say is, judging by the specimens I have met with here and elsewhere, I do not think I would lose much by being excluded from it. So gentlemen, I drink to you and the general reformation of American manners. To report this incident with such candor was extraordinary for its time. It confronted her white Victorian readers with the reality of racism and with her blackness. 
she did not deny her black heritage. She did not have to express um, affinity for her black mother, her black ancestors, but she did. Now, I must say that that was not typical of coloreds in Jamaica in the 19th century. Free colored people in Jamaica expressed more of a solidarity with white society than with black society. She was extremely concerned in her book to challenge any suggestion of pigeonholing. For any Victorian woman to say, I'm me, look at me, listen to me, this is what I want to be. It's incredibly modern concept, but she did so well with it. The outbreak of war in Europe would finally bring Mary Seacole to the attention of the British public. In 1854, Britain sent thousands of soldiers to fight the Russians in the Crimean War. It was a disaster, and the shockwaves were felt in every corner of the British Empire. As Mary Seacole read of soldiers she had known and treated in Jamaica, sailing to their fate, in Britain, public outcry at the mismanagement of the war was about to bring down the government. Very soon after the Crimean campaign began, it became very clear back home that there were certain essential and crucial things that were lacking. And these were things that were likely to prejudice the whole campaign. They were quite simple things. Simple medicines, food, drink, clothes, comfort, somebody just to boost the morale of the soldiers. The loss of life in the Crimea was unprecedented. But of almost 23,000 British fatalities, less than 5,000 died from battle wounds. 18,000 were killed by tropical diseases. There were so many things lacking in the Crimea that Mary was qualified to provide. She recognized that there was a Mary Seacole-shaped chasm in the Crimea, and she went out to fill it. What delight should I not experience if I could be useful to my own sons, suffering for a cause it was so glorious to fight and bleed for? I made up my mind, if the army wanted nurses, they'd be glad of me! In autumn 1854, Mary Seacole set sail on the 20-day voyage to England. At the same time, Another extraordinary woman was sailing for Turkey. Her mission was to bring order to the chaos of the British Army Hospital in Constantinople. Florence Nightingale's ambition was to introduce efficiency and cleanliness to the care of the sick. What she needed most were qualified staff. She took with her 38 nurses, few of them familiar with the diseases raging in the Crimea. A further 46 recruits were due to set out two months later. And a 47th candidate was about to volunteer her services at interview. On arrival in London, Mary Seacole headed straight for the corridors of power in Whitehall. My first idea was to apply to the war office for the post of hospital nurse. Mary never doubted for a minute that when she got to London, she would be snapped up. She knew that she had the instincts to go and make a real difference to the men who were out there. Mary Seacole roamed the headquarters of the British Empire, a place to which her colonial upbringing told her she belonged. She brought references from high-ranking officers and medical staff she'd known and treated in Jamaica. She was turned down by the War Office, rejected by the Quartermaster General's Department, and refused by the Medical Office. Had it not been for my old strong-mindedness, I should have given up the scheme a score of times in as many days. 
so regularly did each successive day give birth to a fresh set of rebuffs and disappointments. Willingly, had they accepted me, I would have worked for the wounded in return for bread and water. Nowhere was the establishment's attitude clearer than amongst the women recruiting for Florence Nightingale's army hospital in Turkey. Once again I tried and had an interview, this time with one of Miss Nightingale's companions. She gave me the same reply. But I read in her face the fact that had there been a vacancy, I should not have been chosen to fill it. One cold evening, I stood in the twilight, which was fast deepening into wintry night, and looked back upon the ruins of my last castle in the air. Doubts and suspicions arose in my heart. Did these ladies shrink from accepting my aid because my blood flowed beneath a somewhat duskier skin than theirs? It was the first time that she admits to feeling crushed when she heard that, that Florence Nightingale's outfit didn't want to employ her. But in a way, she used it to advantage, as she always used any adversity to advantage. She invested that, um, that shock and that disappointment and turned it into the vigour that would send her out there to do what she wanted to do anyway. Snubbed by the establishment, Mary Seacole fell back on the skills that had always served her so well. She would head to the epicentre of the bloodiest war zone in memory and open a Jamaican hotel. It took little more than a good night's rest to strengthen my determination. Let what might happen to the Crimea, I would go. Destined for the front line in Russia, Mary Seacole couldn't resist the temptation to visit the British Army Hospital in Turkey that had rejected her. <coughs> Nurses passed in and out with noiseless tread and subdued manner. I thought many of them had that strange expression of the eyes which those who have gazed long on scenes of war or horror seldom lose. Scutari Hospital was a place of regimentation and strict discipline. With limited resources, Florence Nightingale ran the hospital with an iron hand. I don't think May would ever have fitted into Florence Nightingale's system. I can't imagine Mary with all her feistiness and her opinionated manner and also fundamentally totally different methodology, which was hands-on by the bedside holding a dying man, not standing at a distance. Oh my God. As Seiko bumped into old friends from Jamaica, she instinctively broke one of Nightingale's most cherished rules. Nurses should not fraternize with patients. Oh dear, this is no good. This is no good. At some slight risk of giving offense, I could not resist the temptation of lending a helping hand here and there, easing a stiff bandage that was given pain, or replacing one that had slipped. Oh no, this is disgusting. This will never do. Nightingale's staff assumed Mary Seacole was looking for a job. The stage was set. Two of the most powerful personalities in British medicine were about to come face to face.
a slight figure in the nurse's dress with a pale, gentle, and above all firm face, resting lightly in the palm of one white hand while the other supports the elbow, a position which gives to her countenance a keen inquiring expression, which is rather marked. What do you want, Mrs. Seacole? Anything we can do for you? If it lies within my power, I shall be very happy. I just need a room for tonight, as it's too dark to return to my ship. Certainly. It will be arranged. Florence Nightingale. Good night. That English woman whose name shall never die, but sound on the lips of British men until the hour of doom. One thought never left my mind as I walked through those fearful miles of suffering in that great hospital. If it is so here, what must it be like at the scene of war? I felt happy in the conviction that I must be useful three or four days nearer to the soldiers pressing once than this. Florence Nightingale's hospital was in Turkey, four days' sail from the front line in Russia. Many wounded men refused to risk the journey. Mary Seacole wanted to get as close to the war zone as she could. She stopped at a small patch of land just a few miles from the front and recreated the Jamaica of her youth. In just a few weeks, she had recycled timbers and sheets of metal dredged from the harbour to conjure, out of nowhere, a restaurant, general store and clinic rolled into one. In typical Seco fashion, she called it the British Hotel. You might get everything at Mother Seacole's, from an anchor to a needle. For the outer man, linen and hosiery, boots and shoes, and for the inner man, salmon, lobsters, and oysters in tins, wild fowl, curry powder, snuff, and currant jelly. Or you would have stumbled upon a good Irish stew, nice and hot, or some capital meat pies. I so wish that we had an illustration of the outside of the British Hotel in the Crimea. It's wonderful from the inside, but outside it must have looked extraordinary. It was built from bits and bobs, from flotsam and jetsam. It was a very organic place, with Mary pulsing at the middle of it. I think, in her own very small way, up at that British Hotel, Stranded in the middle of nowhere, Mary provided a little oasis of conviviality. Tails. Yes. Yes. <laughs> of home, of laughter, of normal human intercourse and behaviour, where people could be happy and forget war. Whatever confusion and disorder existed elsewhere, Comfort and order were always to be found at the British Hotel. There are some lovely accounts where soldiers turn up at late at night and there's quite uproarious parties going on with much drinking. And others talk about arriving and having long talks into the night about the old days in the West Indies. But the British Hotel was much more than an officer's club. It was a business whose profits would finance a higher purpose. <laughs> Quite a few of the soldier eyewitnesses in the Crimea said she did not blush 
to charge one and six for a bottle of porter or the highest price for her best champagne. But the fact is, she also made clear that it was because the well-paid navvies in the workhorse that helped transport things to the front, because they could afford her high prices, and because obviously the officers could, that subsidized her, that enabled her to keep going, making her herbal remedies and giving them out free to those without money who needed help. Within weeks of opening, the British Hotel had become the soldier's hospital of choice. Mary Seacole's treatments for cholera and dysentery actually worked. Her success attracted the attention of the Crimean war correspondent, William Howard Russell of the Times. Her hut was surrounded every morning by the rough navvies and land transport men, who had a faith in her proficiency in the healing art, which she justified by many cures. New research has revealed that Mary Seacole was described vividly in more than 20 eyewitness accounts of the war. I was severely attacked by diarrhea after landing in the Crimea, and nothing served me until I called on Mrs. Seacole. She gave me her medicine but once, and I was cured. She was principal medical officer to the Army Works Corps, and at the time of the cholera last summer, used to prescribe pomegranate juice, which was an almost never failing specific. The use of pomegranate was typically effective. It is highly astringent and it's been used quite extensively um, internally, mostly in the treatment of diarrhea. This actually um, has a beneficial effect. So she simply and very undogmatically took the experience she brought with her and applied it under local circumstances. She does integrate things which were highly uncommon and completely unheard of by the uh, medical establishment in Britain. For a soldier sitting there under these enormously difficult circumstances, somebody like Mary must have come like an angel because she finally did something from um, his perspective. It couldn't have been more different at Scutari with its miles of bed-lined corridors, where one-to-one -one treatment was virtually impossible. Florence Nightingale was a superb but impersonal administrator. Patients were treated with fairness, but detachment. She would nod at us, and we could only kiss her shadow. In one other respect, the two women were very different. Florence Nightingale visited the Crimea only twice during the war. Mary Seacole was at the front line almost every day. Mrs. Seacole is often seen riding out to the front with baskets of medicines of her own preparation. Her never failing presence among the wounded after the battle and assisting them made her beloved by the rank and file of the whole army. At the Battle of Chennai, she was found administering creature comforts to the wounded, utterly unmindful of the shot and shell flying about her in all directions. In the teeth of battle, Mary Seacole proved herself as a hands-on surgeon, as William Howard Russell of the Times told his readers. I have witnessed her devotion and courage. I've seen her go down under fire with her store of creature comforts for our wounded men and a more tender or skillful hand about a wound or a broken limb could not be found among our best surgeons. There's one thing that all the eyewitnesses concur on is that Mary was effectively legendary throughout the Crimea. There was this enormous affection for her, amusement too because of her rather loud and domineering manner and her eccentric style of dress, wearing sort of plumed hats in the midst of war. Mary Seacole, the child of the British Army in Jamaica, had effectively become its mother in the Crimea. The deaths in the trenches touched me very deeply. It was very usual when a young officer was ordered into the trenches for him to ride down to the hotel to dine. 
they seldom failed on those occasions to shake my hand at parting. God save the Queen! I used to think it was like having a large family of children ill with fever and dreading to hear which one had passed away in the night. My dear madam, will you do me the favor to accept the enclosed trifle in remembrance of that dear son whose last moments were soothed by your kindness? Death is always terrible. No one need be ashamed to fear it. I have seen some brave men die trembling like children. Whereas others who have spent their lives in avoidance of the least danger or trouble have drawn their last painful breath like heroes striking their foes to the last, robbing them of victory, and making their defeat a triumph. If I were to speak of all the nameless horrors of that spring as plainly as I could, I should disgust you. But a day in the Crimea was a long time to give to grief. By the time British soldiers were finally sent home after defeating the Russians in 1856, Mary Seacole had served 18 months in the Crimea. When the war ended and her boys were all sent off here, there, many on to the Indian mutiny, she was completely rudderless. She'd lost her huge family. All this going home seemed strange and somewhat sad. And sometimes I felt that I could not sympathize with the glad faces and happy hearts of those who were looking forward to the delights of home. For I clearly had no home to go to. The Jamaican doctress, who had risked so much in her role as a mother of the British Army, faced the prospect of returning to London and nobody. She had invested all her capital in new supplies. It seemed everything she owned would now fall into Russian hands. I was glad to hear of peace, although it must have been apparent to everyone that it would cause my ruin. Mary Seacole returned to London with nothing. When Mary Seacole returned to London from the Crimean War in 1856, she was bankrupt. Although I was not ashamed of poverty, beginning life again in the autumn, I mean late in the summer of life, is hard uphill work. In her rented rooms in Covent Garden, she could comfort herself with the four government medals she'd received for her kindness to British soldiers. And the British soldiers were not about to forget her. A roster of Crimean veterans organized a spectacular fundraising gala for Mary Seacole in July 1857 at London's Royal Surrey Gardens. The orchestra was immense, formed by the bands of the regiments of the Guards, the Royal Engineers, the Royal Artillery and the 11th Hussars. Over four consecutive nights, 
80,000 people turned up and bought tickets to celebrate their Crimean hero. The gardens and the splendid music hall were crowded every evening, and Mrs. Seacole, as soon as she was recognized, was greeted with loud cheers and every demonstration of enthusiasm. At the end of both the first and second parts of the entertainment, the name of Mrs. Seacole was shouted by a thousand voices. She was a real celebrity. It's extraordinary that this black woman, whom nobody one had heard of before, nobody outside the military, should arrive in London and be celebrated and carried around on soldiers' shoulders. Um, it was just completely unprecedented. Never one to miss a commercial opportunity, she used the occasion to launch her memoirs. Mary's autobiography, The Wonderful Adventures of Mrs. Seacole, I mean, the title itself tells you how extravagant the book it is. It's a masterful exercise in self-publicity. She was fully in charge of her image the whole time, but she managed to marry that with, I think, a deeply felt conviction that she wanted to be useful to people. The services of Mrs. Seacole in the Crimea Mary Seacole's fame was no flash in the pan. Being deserving of recognition and reward from the Army, Navy and British nation. A decade later, her supporters in the upper echelons of British society joined together to provide her with a pension. And the Queen having been graciously pleased to express her approbation of Mrs. Seacole's services. Queen Victoria donated 50 pounds towards her welfare in old age. Alexandra, Princess of Wales, employed her as a masseuse. And the Queen's nephew, Count Glycan, sculpted her. Mary Seacole was finally accepted in the bosom of the British Empire. His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh. But not everyone welcomed Seacole's recognition. A recently discovered letter written by Florence Nightingale reveals her indignation at Seacole's celebrity. She felt Queen Victoria had been duped. A shameful or ignorant imposture was practiced on the Queen, who subscribed to the Seacole testimonial. The fundamental problem for Florence Nightingale was that Mary didn't operate just as a nurse under Florence's thumb at Scutari. The problem was that Mary was a woman of business. She made money, and the biggest problem of all was that she sold alcohol. Nightingale's antagonism went further, most damningly when Mary Seacole once again volunteered her services to the nation. Florence Nightingale intervened with a poisonous job reference, insinuating that she was little more than a brothel keeper. She kept, I will not call it a bad house, but something not very unlike it, in the Crimean War. Anyone who employs Mrs. Seacole will introduce much kindness, also much drunkenness and improper conduct, wherever she is. Yet even Nightingale's slanderous disapproval couldn't dent Seacole's reputation. Punch magazine summarized her unique contribution. Be the right man in the right place who can. The right woman was Dame Seacole. Mary Seacole died in her sleep in London on the 14th of May, 1881. She was 76. Reader, now that we've come to the end of this chapter, please look back and see how hard the right woman had to struggle to convey herself to the right place. For a while, the Seacole legend was sustained by the veterans who knew and loved her. When they died, there was no one left to carry her flame. It was the sort of celebrity that burns very brightly while you're alive. Um, but I think when you die, it goes out.
As Mary Seacole was forgotten, so too were the herbal and holistic medicines from the Caribbean that had helped so many in the Crimea. They were ignored by the medical orthodoxy of the time. This was not part of the British healing tradition. And the British healing tradition was much more formal, much more focused on doing things in a medical way, as it was seen then, and obviously in keeping a distance between the patient, the other, and the healer. If Mary Seacole was the wrong kind of doctor for late 19th century Britain, the greater obstacle to her recognition was the prejudice that she had the wrong color skin. There's no doubt that attitude towards uh, blacks, uh, racial attitudes, hardened significantly. We know this to be the case. We know the after effects of the Indian mutiny. We know the after effects of the Moran Bay Rebellion in Jamaica. And we know that all these things helped to harden racial attitudes within this country. For most of the 20th century, Britain saw no need for black heroes. Mary Seacole, however, made a comeback in 1984 when her autobiography was republished. Ever since, interest in her life has gained momentum as people have once again discovered her remarkable story. Mary Seacole was a phenomenal woman, an independent, free-spirited woman. Mary Seacole's success in the Crimea uh, indeed, her success in Panama had to do with her experiences, her training, her background, her preparation in Jamaica. If you take Mary Seacole's experiences in the Crimea away from her Jamaican background, then you miss what made her Mary Seacole, what made her such a woman. Mary Seacole is now studied by every school child in Britain as part of the national curriculum. And in a nationwide poll in 2004, she was voted greatest black Briton of all time. In the same year, a long-lost portrait of her was rediscovered by Helen Rappaport. It now hangs in the National Portrait Gallery, facing Florence Nightingale. It's an image of the mature Mary after the war, very proud, very dignified, and it's iconic because she wears the red scarf of the Jamaican, of the Creole, which is her signifier. She's a proud Jamaican, but she also wears her medals. And she's a proud British subject. And it's an amalgam of the two sides of Mary, her Britishness and her Jamaicanness. It's a wonderful image of an extraordinary woman with her chin tilted up, saying, here I am, I am a Crimean heroine. In the bicentenary of her birth, the unique self-made woman, who was neither black nor white, who was both a fiercely proud Jamaican and an ardent British patriot, has reclaimed her place at the heart of history.